Dr. Fo, thank you for speaking with me today. Could you start by telling me about your background and how you came to be so heavily involved in social media? Sure. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm an uh, internal medicine physician. I practice in Nashua, New Hampshire in, in the United States, a small town about 45 minutes north of Boston. And I've been practicing for about 10 years now. My social media experience started back in 2004, and the reason I did it is that I felt doctors didn't have a voice in the media. They, they weren't heard. And I think that was a problem because a lot of patients would call up my office and they would say, Dr. Poe, I saw this story in the newspaper and I, or I saw this uh, story in television and I want to know what this means to me. And because of space or time constraints, these stories didn't have a lot of physician commentary that can give patients that type of meaning that they, they sought. So I thought that social media, starting with my blog, would be a great way to to provide that dynamic physician commentary that can keep up with the pace of, of breaking medical news. And it's evolved since then, and, and social media has afforded a lot of ways for doctors to communicate directly with their patients and, and help them interpret the news. And now with healthcare reform in the United States, I think it also gives a way for doctors to express their opinions as well on, on how they think our healthcare system could change. So it's opened up a lot of opportunities for me and I think it should open up a lot of opportunities for other physicians as well going forward. What inspired you to set up KevinMD.com? Well, I mentioned that more and more patients are going online to, to look for health information. I think the recent data shows that 8 out of 10 Internet users go on the web to look for health information, and but only a, a quarter of them looked at the source of the information that they read. And as we know, there's a lot of bad information online. There's a lot of information from companies who's trying to sell products or people who are trying to push an agenda. So I think there's a role for health professionals to also get online and guide patients to better sources of health information. So one of the main goals of my blog is to be that source of reputable health information, uh, provide not only my opinions but the opinions of other physicians as well so we can um, interpret the news and 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 talk about some of the studies that are released and provide that context so patients can better interpret medical news. So I think one of the, the goals that I have is, is not only to be a voice of doctors, but be a voice of reason for patients so they can so they can better sift through the information that they, they read on the web. And what benefits do you find that social media brings to you as a physician and what advice would you give to other physicians who are yet to engage in this way? The biggest benefit is that it gives doctors a voice. A lot of doctors are busy seeing patients in the exam room or in the office, and, and sometimes they just want their voice heard in, in, in the media. And I think social media gives anybody a way, that, a way for them to publish. Anyone can start a blog, for instance. It doesn't cost anything, and they could write what they think about various news studies or health stories, and, and they could be read on the web. And I think... Being found on the web is, is, is tremendously important because the more, the more doctors write on a blog, for instance, the more that they'll be found. And studies show now that patients are going online not only to look for medical information about themselves, but they're going online to look for information about doctors as well. So the more a doctor gets involved in social media, the more defined they'll be. I call it a digital footprint the more a doctor can define their digital footprint and really be proactive in how they shape their online presence on the web. And I think that's tremendously important. In terms of advice to other doctors, I'd say, I'd say I'd go for it. I know when I talk to a lot of doctors about social media, they're scared, they're scared of the unknown, and they read a lot of negative stories about social media. But I think there are a lot of benefits as well, and I think one of the biggest ones, it allows doctors to really define that online presence. They could go uh, on uh, LinkedIn, for instance, or have a Google profile, and they control that information. And whenever a patient looks them up on a search engine, that's the type of information that's, co that's going to come up. So by participating with social media, it, it helps a doctor be proactive on how they appear online. And what are the biggest challenges in, in using social media as a physician, and what can be done to overcome them? 
think the biggest challenge is is overcoming a lot of the negative news stories that that you hear whenever healthcare professionals use social media. Whenever you open a newspaper and there is an article on a topic, it's always uh, some doctor inappropriately using social media, or a or a nurse, for instance, who would post pictures from her cell phone onto Facebook, and and they would get in trouble or get fired from the hospital. So I think a lot of that news is is negative. So what I try to do is accentuate some of the benefits and the positive, and I think that takes a lot of a lot of education. We need to educate health professionals to appropriately use social media act professional online. They need to use the web appropriately to not disclose patient information. Because the more we, we educate, the, uh, the, the less of a chance these healthcare professionals would get in trouble, on, uh, would stay out of trouble uh, online. So I think overcoming those negative connotations that we have social media would be the first step. A second challenge that I see is that doctors in general, don't have a lot of time. We're too busy seeing patients. We have to go to the hospital. We need to deal with paperwork. Who has time for social media? And we need to make social media part of a doctor's workday and show them the value in using it to better connect with patients. And the more we accentuate this type of positive and the the value, I think, the more we can include physicians in, in, in using different social media tools. So I think those are the two biggest challenges we face in getting more doctors to adopt social media. And in your opinion, how can the pharma industry better engage with physicians in this space? I think that's a difficult question. In the United States, there's a lot of cynicism when it comes to to pharmaceutical presence uh, online. And I think that the pharma industry needs to, to overcome that. Right now, I think pharma in itself, they're trying to grapple with with um, how they can better use social media. Um, I think the best way is to embrace the transparency that social media, social media offers. Um, I think that uh, both doctors and pharma can use social media to, to, um, to better explain where they're coming from, to share information. Because I think in the end, both industries want what's best for the patients. And I think social media can be a great way for for doctors and pharma to, to, to collaborate to, to improve patient care. By its nature, social media is, is very transparent, and um, I think both sets, both groups are trying to find ways to, to, uh, to embrace that. And once we find a way to embrace that transparency and use it appropriately, I think it's going to help patients in the end. Great. In a recent blog post, you discussed pain management and how there is a lack of understanding in this area. What issues do you think this underlines with communication about particular disorders? Well, I think chronic pain is a huge issue. Um, in the United States, the Institute of Medicine uh, recently released, released a guideline last year that really encapsulated the problem. They, their document is called The Leaving Pain in America. It shows that 116 million adults in the United States suffer from chronic pain, and that's more than the total affected by heart disease, cancer, and diabetes combined. And the cost of chronic pain exceeded $600 billion a year. And I wrote an editorial on this in USA Today, and I wrote that not only are chronic pain patients being inappropriately treated, I think that it's very difficult for healthcare providers to treat them as well, because in addition to the chronic pain epidemic, there's also an epidemic of prescription drug abuse. So I think that there is a balance that healthcare providers need to need to weigh. They they want to treat chronic pain patients appropriately, yet you don't want to contribute to the prescription drug problem. And I think this is a huge issue um, that makes treating chronic pain very very difficult. So one of the ways that um, I suggest in, in, in approaching this problem is, is better education. We need to better educate patients that there are other modalities to treat chronic pain other than opioid-type medications, and we need to educate them about the the potential for abuse and and its side effects. But not only that, we need to educate doctors and other health professionals as well, because a lot of doctors don't have any formal training when it comes to chronic pain. I think the number is something like five out of the country's 133 medical schools have formal courses in chronic pain, and that's not nearly enough. Um, And doctors need to educate 
patients in, that there are other ways to, to treat chronic pain other than medication. So we need more attention on the issue, but not only that, we need more education both from the patient and provider side. And once that happens, we can start uh, uh, approaching this problem that, that's grown to, to, to an epidemic scale here. Kevin, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.